Today, let's look at a part of the female reproductive system called an ovary. Ovaries are paired organs which are located in lesser pelvis on both sides of the uterus. Their almond-shaped bodies, approximately 3 cm long, weighing from 6 to 10 grams. Ovaries are located within the peritoneum, which means they're intraperitoneal organs covered by visceral peritoneum. Its mesothelium is modified into a higher, simple cuboidal epithelium called the germinal epithelium. The name germinal comes from a time when people thought that it gives rise to germinal cells, which we now know is not true. Primordial germ cells originate in the walls of the yolk sac and migrate to the gonadal primordia, where they induce formation of gonads, in this case ovaries. There is a layer of denser connective tissue right under the germinal epithelium called tunica albuginea. In the section we can distinguish two parts of the ovary, cortex and medulla. Cortex comprises loose connective tissue with a lot of fibroblasts, smooth muscle cells, reticular and collagen fibers, and a lot of follicles in various stages of their development. The medulla is located centrally and is made up of denser connective tissue than it was in the cortex and contains no follicles. Ovarian follicle is a structure made up of one oocyte surrounded by layers of follicular cells and thecal cells. By the end of the fifth month of fetus development, ogonia arrive at the cortex of the ovary. They undergo mitosis, some of them get bigger and become primary oocytes. Each oocyte then gets surrounded by flattened supportive cells called follicular cells, and the whole structure is called a primordial follicle. Primary oocyte undergoes the prophase of meiosis and is arrested in a stage called dictyotene until ovulation takes place. After ovulation, the oocyte completes the first meiotic division and chromosomes are equally divided between two daughter cells, a secondary oocyte and a polar body. Afterwards, the secondary oocyte enters the second meiotic division, which arrests in metaphase and is completed after fertilization when it divides into a definite oocyte and another polar body. Now we are looking at the section of rabbit's ovary, where we can distinguish various phases of developing follicles. We can find primordial follicles right under the tunica albuginea. They consist of the primary oocyte, which is enveloped by a single layer of flattened follicular cells. Follicular cells form epithelium that sits on a basement membrane. Their function involves nourishment and protection of the oocyte, which, just like spermatozoa, does not display major histocompatibility complex 1, MHC1. Immune system attacks and destroys cells which do not display MHC1, thus we can see the importance of follicular cells which prevent this. As a woman reaches puberty, adenohypophysis starts production of follicle stimulating hormone, FSH, which causes a cyclic growth and maturation of follicles. In our species, only one usually gets fully developed. We distinguish primary, secondary and mature or graphene follicles. Now let's look at how primordial follicle changes into a unilaminar primary follicle, which still consists of an oocyte and a single layer of follicular cells. In the first phase, oocyte continues its growth and its diameter reaches up to 150 micrometers. Follicular cells form a simple cuboidal or even columnar epithelium around the growing oocyte. They also produce proteins. Stages of development of a follicle are not strictly demarcated, so we can distinguish an early unilaminar primary follicle and a late one. The late unilaminar primary follicle is bigger in size, but still has only one layer of follicular cells. Follicular cells divide mitotically, forming layers. The follicle becomes a multilaminar primary follicle. This is an example of an early multilaminar follicle. The stratified epithelium around the oocyte is called the membrana granulosa. The follicular cells can be called granulosa cells in more matured follicles. There is a nucleus and a nucleolus clearly visible in the oocyte. Follicular cells that are around it produce a layer of glycoproteins and glycosaminoglycans which separates the oocyte and the follicular cells and is called zona pellucida. 
both follicular cells and oocytes microvilli are in a direct contact with the zona pellucida. Basement membrane located under follicular cells is very well developed. As soon as the follicle reaches the multilaminar stage, we call it membrane of Slavyansky. Loose connective tissue around the follicle starts differentiating into two layers, theca interna and theca externa. Although we can see them here, they are much better developed in the late stages of the follicle, so we'll have a look at them later. Let's revise the stages of development. We can see primordial follicles, primary unilaminar follicles, and primary multilaminar follicles. We can't see a nucleus in each oocyte because the section was performed either under or above the nucleus. Liquid moves out of the blood vessels and accumulates between follicular cells, which secrete their products into it. This liquid is called follicular fluid or liquor folliculi. It is located within small cavities. Then they gradually coalesce and in the end form one big cavity called antrum. Follicles with cavities between granulosa cells are called antral or secondary follicles. Follicular cells immediately around and linked to the oocyte make up the corona radiata and other cells a bit further from the oocyte form a small hillock, the cumulus oophorus, surrounding the oocyte and protruding into the antrum, at the same time fixing it to the wall of the follicle. Theca interna comprises fibroblasts which change in shape, forming round cells and changing their structure into steroid producing cells. We call these changed fibroblasts thecal cells. This layer is a well vascularized endocrine tissue. Thecal cells produce androcendione, which then moves up to the follicular cells. They have a so-called aromatase enzyme which converts androstendione to estrogens, female sex hormones. There is one more layer around theca interna, which is called theca externa. It consists of a bit denser but still loose connective tissue from the cortex. Secondary follicle has more than 0.2 mm in diameter and keeps growing into a mature graphene follicle. We cannot see a graphene follicle in this section. There is one more structure in this section, and it is the fimbriae of the fallopian tube. Fimbriae capture the oocyte after it escapes from the ovary. Only a certain number of follicles undergo the process of development up to the point of ovulation. Most ovarian follicles undergo the degenerative process, called atresia. We can see some follicles undergoing atresia here. Woman's ovary differs from the rabbit's one. We can't see so many developing follicles here because there is a smaller number of them. As a result, it is more difficult to get the right section so that we would see all the stages of development. There are some primordial follicles under tunica albuginea which are developing into primary unilaminar and multilaminar follicles. The biggest follicle is the secondary follicle. We cannot see the graphene follicle in this section. It usually grows up to 2.5 cm and protrudes from the surface of the ovary. At ovulation, graphene follicle ruptures and oocyte escapes alongside with zona pellucida and cells of corona radiata. After follicular fluid leaks out, graphene follicle collapses. Subsequently, it fills with a little bit of blood, which then coagulates. Cells of granulosa and theca interna form a temporary endocrine structure whose name is corpus luteum, from Latin meaning yellow body. We have corpus luteum in our next section. There is a core made of fibrin in the center of the follicle. It's basically a blood clot. After ovulation, granulosa cells discontinue their division and change their structure from protein-producing cells to steroid-producing cells. As a result, their name also changes. We now call them granulosa lutein cells. They are eosinophilic and produce progesterone. At the same time, they keep their aromatase enzyme and continue the conversion of androstendione produced by thecal cells to estrogens. The former theca interna contributes to the other component of the corpus luteum, giving rise to theca lutein cells. They are smaller than granulosa lutein cells and are in the periphery of corpus luteum. 
Theca lutein cells also produce progesterone and continue their production of androstenedione as a precursor for estrogen. These cells have a strong eosinophilic cytoplasm, but it is hardly visible because they also contain a lot of lipid droplets, which were washed out of the slide preparation. There are thecal septa made of connective tissue protruding from theca externa to the center of the corpus luteum. The blood clot in the center is gradually replaced by connective tissue. There is a certain level of luteinizing hormone, LH hormone, in blood needed in order to maintain the existence of the corpus luteum. LH is produced by adenohypophysis. Progesterone, produced by the corpus luteum, works as a negative feedback mechanism, slowing down the release of LH from adenohypophysis. As a consequence, as time goes by, corpus luteum degenerates. In case that fertilization of the oocyte occurs, human chorionic gonadotropin, HCG, produced by syncytiotrophoblast, prevents the degeneration of corpus luteum. It functions similarly to the LH, so the corpus luteum gains in size and continues the production of progesterone. Cells of corpus luteum, having done their job, undergo programmed cell death, so-called apoptosis. This process results in a structure called corpus albicans, from Latin whitish body. There is corpus albicans in the section of woman's ovary. It is a pale whitish structure made of dense connective tissue. After some time, remnants of the corpus albicans are phagocytosed by macrophages and replaced by a connective tissue from the cortex of the ovary.